My name is Peter Shea. I am uh, currently the Associate Provost at the University of Albany, which is in the State University of New York. It's a large system of higher education of 400,000 students in the system. We have about uh, 17, 18,000 students in our university. Uh, as the Associate Provost, uh, I play a role in uh, promoting strategic banking and uh, the expansion and sort of the right sizing of online learning uh, commensurate with the uh, vision and mission of a research university. So that's one role I play. I'm also a faculty in the School of Educational Theory and Practice, which is part of the School of Education. It's a joint appointment in the College of Computing and Information. And the area of research that I've been working on most recently is about the success of community college students in online learning. Online learning touches every dimension of the university because it's about learning and it's what the university and what the college and what all higher education institutions do is, is to promote learning. And I think that there's a role for everyone to play, but I think if there's going to be um, an important role that uh, leadership can play, it's to promote the discussion, it's to provide leadership, it's to create a vision that people can get behind but frequently creating that vision requires input from many, many stakeholders. On our own campus, for example, our, uh, our process was to include uh, a large uh, um, segment of faculty from across every unit in the institution in discussions around what is the proper role of online learning in a, un a research university. That went on for a, uh, at least a year, just the discussions just went on for a year to get to the point where we had documents that were shared, that were agreed to, uh, where there was a lot of input and a very democratic process. I think that creates a firmer foundation for building buy-in and then engaging in further discussions. Um, we're going to be having discussions with deans next week about uh, where we should be going, where they should be going, how are they going to grow online learning, what, where does it fit within their particular units and, and in their departments. And, uh, so I think that it starts with uh, conversations that need to have a lot of voice. So I think uh, one of the goals of online learning has been for a long time to increase access to higher education. It's uh, an important goal. There was a speaker this morning who was talking about essentially the degrading kind of state of higher education in the United States, not relative to itself but relative to the rest of the world, that uh, there are fewer and fewer students who are getting higher education credentials relative to other countries. So in a sense in the global economy the uh, outcomes are, are not terrific for the United States. So I think we're seeing uh, an increasing need societally to uh, expand access and opportunities for students to participate in post-secondary education and uh, so I think one form of access that reaches out to people who are not members of the culture of higher education. It's the community college system in the United States. It's maybe the junior college system in other countries. Um, it represents challenges though. I think there's been some very strong research that has been conducted uh, at the Community College Research Center at Teachers College in Columbia University in New York City. Shauna Smith Jagger has done some of this work uh, looking at state level data uh, at community college systems in Virginia and Washington and finding that uh, online learning at the course level especially seems to have outcomes that are not particularly advantageous for those learners. So they found that students who are taking online courses are uh, more likely to fail, more likely to withdraw, less likely to transfer, less likely to attain a degree. And uh, they use relatively large sample sizes, uh, tens of thousands of students in, in both uh, of the studies. So we were trying to figure out, well, you know, there's been a lot of efforts across the country. Those are two, st two systems, two state systems of 48 other states with uh, community college systems, community college learners. And we're wondering, are the outcomes the same uh, across the country? So we got access to something called the Beginning Post-Secondary Student Survey, which is a uh, a large uh, set data set that's collected by the Institute for Education Science, Department of Education, National Center for Education Statistics. And we uh, looked across the, the, the data, there's a, a five year, a six year period that the beginning post-secondary student survey tracks students uh, starting in 2004. And we looked at whether students were enrolled in distance education courses or did not enroll in distance education courses. And we did two different studies. In one study, we created equivalent groups based on 40 different 
variables for using something called propensity score analysis and trying to determine could we create equivalent variables, uh, equivalent groups based on all of these other variables that would say, okay, these are definitely apples to apples comparisons. And the only thing that's different is did those students take online or distance education courses? So using that propensity score analysis uh, approach, we created these equivalent groups and then looked at outcomes over the subsequent years. And what we found is that students, you know, net of these 40 other factors and these 40 other variables, including things like demographics and race and age, gender, uh, uh, NCES derived risk categories, that students who had taken online courses were graduating at higher rates than students who had not. Using a nationally representative data set for community college students, we thought that was um, interesting uh, and, you know, a sort of added a level of nuance to the data and to the, the research, you know, very rigorous research that's been conducted on the Washington system and the Virginia system. I think the course level outcomes do tend, you know, according to their research, do tend to be worse. And it, but it appears that the larger program level outcomes may be better. And um, we've, you know, found it heartening that um, students are using online learning in ways that seem to be strategic and regardless of background um, and that they're able to navigate their way through the higher education system more uh, effectively and attain degrees at higher rates. The study that I talked about this morning actually looked a little at another level at which um, students are using uh, online learning. And we're, we looked at three different outcomes, attainment of a degree, dropout, and transfer. And we're looking at the timing of those different outcomes. And, We've used like the completion. completion rates, transfer rates. So there's a number of outcomes that, you, that are indicative of success uh, at the community college level, at any, you know, any college level. And so we're trying to see, you know, net of other factors. Did students who took online courses or distance education courses succeed in ways that are uh, more efficient? So the time to degree we looked at. So we looked over a period of uh, five years and found that at the, by the third year, um, the online students started to, uh, students who had taken at least one online course in the early years um, were starting to show advantages in terms of degree completion and transfer and lower dropout. So by the end of the six, uh, sixth year, we're seeing that students uh, who had taken some online courses, net of these other factors, were still uh, having better outcomes, better three-year outcomes and better six-year outcomes. And this, again, this is national level data, so we think it's representative to a certain extent of the state. This isn't to say that online learning is any kind of panacea for the problems that confront higher education. I think um, there's many different problems. I think there's uh, issues of quality at the course level that need, need to be addressed, and there's at least evidence that there's issues at the course level that need to be addressed. But I think it does provide some rationale for continuing to experiment with and expand uh, online learning in higher education in the United States. I think there's this common sort of phenomenon in the use of technologies in, uh, in educational outcomes, and typically there's no significant difference phenomenon. I think where you find significant differences is sort of a, an anomaly rather than the norm. But I think there is an opportunity for, uh, in some ways, at least uh, improving quality while retaining costs at the same level. Um, I think, you know, if we look at the expansion of online learning opportunities, there are certain dimensions where there are cost savings, but I don't think that's the number one priority the institution should have in mind when they're in developing online programs. They should be thinking about how can we better serve our students? How can we better promote learning? How can we better improve the situation of students? And, in our university and, and in the wider world and society, how can we make, you know, how can we help people become better critical thinkers? How can pe help people become more effective citizens? Um, but the, uh, I think there is certain efficiencies that can be gained. If, if we're looking at the, the, our study, for example, students who increase uh, time to degree who, who, or who shorten time to degree uh, are going to be spending less money. They're going to be sp spending, there's going to be opportunity costs that are not uh, lost. They can. Uh, begin to engage in the world of work and begin to probably pay off loans that they've <laughs> incurred and those economic uh, consequences can be, uh, I think, in the aggregate can be profound. I think the studies that we did uh, suggest at least that online education not only uh, appears to uh, increase the attainment of credentials but increases the efficiency by which students attain credentials. Uh, we seem to see students who are 
uh, attaining credentials earlier and faster uh, if they're using online learning. We don't have great data. I think that's one of the problems the Department of Education could probably facilitate some of this with the additional data collection at a national level. They're already doing quite a bit of data collection and adding to those efforts would be, would be very, very helpful. Um, we, you know, we, we could learn a lot more uh, about how online learning is helping or hindering student outcomes if we had better data. Any time that you're talking about a new approach that's foreign to faculty and foreign to other support staff and, and leadership at the institution, you're talking about cultural change, and cultural change happens uh, generally slowly. So I would recommend more of an incremental change. I, I don't think that there's a magic bullet that's going to say, we don't do this today and tomorrow we're going to do a lot of it. I think you know, there needs to be the kinds of conversations that um, make people feel like they have voice in the decisions that are happening, that give people genuine voice in the decisions that are happening, and have people understand the, I think, really the big picture. It is, we are not doing this to save money. We're not doing this to make money. We're not doing this uh, for efficiency. We're doing this because it's going to help, and it's going to help in ways that are profound uh, and uh, have a tremendous impact on the lives of the students that we serve. Uh, I think at the you know at the provost level, I'm, um, there's so many different challenges that are coming out of provost at any given time that they they live in a higher education ecosystem where it's a constant. Uh, let's look at ourselves in the mirror and let's look over across the hedge. What's everybody else doing? What's happening in the wider world? Are we you know are we keeping up? Are we leading? Are we falling behind? And I think lately uh, what's happened is that uh, online learning has gotten a lot more attention largely because of the entrance of the elite institutions into the online learning sphere through the development of mass open online courses. I think um, MOOCs represent many different things to many different people, but I think at their most idealistic and aspirational form that they represent uh, a good fit with the mission of public higher education, which is to extend and expand higher opportunities to learn to, to everybody. Um, I'd say that that leadership was in some ways provided by uh, early adopters of open educational resources and there's a long history of open, edu open educational resources in places like MIT. And I think that OER movement kind of just expanded into the mass open online courses just to create a lot of attention. So that attention I think in some ways has been a bubble and but it's created more interest in uh, I, what I think is the more important uh, dimensions of online education which is uh, its credential conferring role. So traditional online learning is not the same as mass open online courses, obviously, and the attainment of credentials has profound consequences in the lives of students uh, who get them. And for those who don't get them, we know there are other kinds of consequences, more profound consequences. There are uh, obviously, you know, just the lack of the enrichment of the intellectual life uh, that universities and college can provide, but also there's uh, tremendous consequences in terms of unemployment and uh, health outcomes, happiness outcomes um, that uh, people don't have access to. So I think the MOOC movement created just an opportunity to have more discussions about online learning and I think it's expanding. Um, I think for at the, at the provost level there's many different problems that need to be solved. In public higher education, I think the main problem that we're trying to solve is an, an issue of access and an issue of uh, lately, you know, increasing accountability, uh, improving time to degree, and, and improving persistence, improving student outcomes, and those are the kind of pain points. That